I'm Connie Chung, and we're about to see eye to eye. See, I'm standing there, and a, and a judge sentenced me to death for something I didn't do. And the people were applauding. I was alone. Kurt Lutzworth was convicted twice for the brutal murder of a little girl, a murder he didn't commit. I walked out of the prison, and I said, uh, this is a little scary, this kid's innocent. Meanwhile, a guy's spending nine years in prison for something he didn't do. Tonight, one man's dramatic fight for justice and freedom. You gotta understand that this could happen to anybody. She was in the delivery room, and the contractions were getting more frequent. Houston oiler David Williams had to choose family or football. The phone rings, and the coaches were telling him there's a 650 flight. You'll hear the inside story of America's newest hero. That's when the doctor came in and took the phone out of the wall because it was just getting to be too much. I wasn't going to leave until he was born. Give me load and commence firing. When these teenagers pull the trigger, guess who's paying for the ammunition? You are. It's not really a question of funding for the shooting sport. You're, you're really funding the future of the country. And one congresswoman is spitting bullets. The federal government should not be subsidizing recreational shooting any more than they should be uh, subsidizing windsurfing, uh, baseball games, or football games. Are they preparing for war or just wasting your money? Do they know something you don't know? All I can say is my life has gotten richer since the angels have come in. Yes, angels are in. Can I remember that wonderful movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where when you hear a bell... An angel gets his wings. Do you believe in angels? Two out of three Americans do. That's right. That's right. That's right. Those stories and a late report on the California fire tonight on Eye to Eye. It's Eye to Eye with Connie Chung, with correspondents Bernard Goldberg, Edie Magnus, Russ Mitchell, and Roberta Baskin. Good evening. An innocent man trapped in a nightmare handed a death sentence for a crime he didn't commit. It may not happen often, but it does happen. In fact, in the last year alone, four men sentenced to die were freed when it turned out they were not guilty. Edie Magnus is here with the story of one of those men, a man who refused to give up. Edie? Connie, Kirk Bloodsworth was sentenced to death for a horrible murder. Instead, this man who for nine years insisted he was innocent, he is free at last. I guess it was something like being born again, you know? It was like, I'm 32 years old and I'm a baby, you know? And here I am, I'm unleashed on the world again, and, and everything is so new to me, you know? New because Kirk Bloodsworth for so long was denied what we take for granted. That was me, sitting in front of the door, sitting there plucking at my shoe or my slipper or something when I was in prison. That was me. I couldn't stand to look at him. I had to walk away. Bloodsworth sat behind bars for nine years, serving a life sentence for a crime he didn't commit. The story of how he got out is one of luck and technology. The far more disturbing story is about how he got in. It was summer, 1984, in Baltimore County, Maryland. A nine-year-old girl, Dawn Hamilton, was tortured, sodomized, and murdered in the woods near her home. It was one of the most horrifying crimes ever committed in the area. There was tremendous pressure to solve the case. Sixteen days and hundreds of possible suspects later, the police closed in on one, 23-year-old Kirk Bloodsworth. Did they tell you what they were arresting you for? First-degree murder and the death of Dawn Hamilton. The police had stitched together a circumstantial case against Bloodsworth. He had worked a mile from the crime scene, had left his wife, his job, and the area ten days after the murder. And he looked like this composite. There was just one problem. I didn't do it. Not guilty. 
Robert Lazaro was the lead prosecutor. We didn't have a confession. We didn't have any physical evidence. What the state did have was two witnesses putting Bloodsworth near the murder scene. Two boys, ages 10 and 7. They were fishing when they saw a man walk with Dawn into the woods shortly before she was murdered. The crux of the case really was putting him at the scene with the girl, the two young boys. And they peg him at 6'5". And Kirk was only about six feet. Well, that's not unusual. They said he had blonde hair. Mm -hmm. Kirk had red hair. Mm -hmm. I mean, they weren't necessarily describing Kirk Bloodsworth. I understand that, but the bottom line is that they selected him independently of each other as absolutely being the person they saw. Kirk Bloodsworth grew up in a middle-class family on Maryland's eastern shore, among oystermen and crabbers where little boys prefer fishing over baseball. He graduated from a small Christian high school, like his father joined the Marines, and was honorably discharged four years later. Bloodsworth had no criminal record. How much pressure was there to get a conviction in this case? The only pressure that there was was self-imposed. Meaning you wanted to get him? Yes. I was absolutely convinced he did it. What convinced anyone that Bloodsworth could commit such brutality? The prosecutors relied on an FBI psychological profile of the murderer. They focused on one key characteristic. This was somebody who would have been dominated by women, by their spouse or girlfriend, and probably by their mother. Bloodsworth says the prosecutors distorted typical problems he had with his wife and mother to make their case. They were always trying to stick that square peg in that round hole and it would never fit. It fit for the jury. They took only two hours to find Bloodsworth guilty of Don Hamilton's murder. That was the loneliest day of my life. Tell me about that day. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, st I'm standing there and a, and a judge sentenced me to death for something I didn't do. And here I am, and the people are applauding. I was alone. I was labeled something that's not me even close to me as a person and human being. Bloodsworth was sent to the Maryland State Penitentiary. For two years, he spent 23 hours a day in a cell just above the gas chamber. Prison chaplain Al Rose saw Bloodsworth through the horror of it. Uh, there were crazy people who would urinate on the floor and it would drip through to the cells below. People who would throw feces or spread feces on the walls. Uh, it was below freezing in the winter it was 110 in the summer these these metal boxes of six by eight it was a hell how did you sort of hold it together the fact alone that I, you know, I knew i was innocent what bloodsworth didn't know was that three days after his conviction the police and prosecutors learned about a compelling possible suspect Someone who, just after Dawn's murder, had shown up at a nearby mental health clinic with, according to one witness, fresh scratches on his face. Someone who told a therapist he was in trouble with a little girl. Someone who looked like the composite. But with Bloodsworth behind bars, the police seemed in no rush to check out the tip. Do you know whether it was investigated? I believe they did, yes. It was investigated. I think that the records indicate that it was six months before they did anything. That may have been. The time constraints that they're under uh, are enormous. The overtime's crazy. They don't sleep. They don't see their families. And what, where do you With prioritize? With respect, what about Bloodsworth? I mean, oh, I, I feel sorry for the overworked cops, but meanwhile, the guy's spending nine years in prison for something he didn't do. No, I understand that. But at the same time, they're not going to be able to, to just work on only that. The Baltimore County Police refused to talk about the case with eye to eye, but we obtained the detective's report on their only meeting with the potential suspect, David Rehill. They wrote that although he resembled the composite, Rehill was smaller than the man the little boys described. They never checked his alibi and never put him in a lineup. What do you say to the criticism that the system closed in on one guy with some evidence, and that everybody just stopped looking at other things that didn't fit. I would say that, unfortunately, that is not all that rare of an occurrence. 
in our criminal justice system. After two years under a death sentence, Bloodsworth finally seemed to catch a break. He got a new trial on a legal technicality, not because of the possible suspect. In fact, although the state had known about Rehill for two years, the information was withheld from the defense until just days before the second trial. Bloodsworth's lawyers didn't have time to investigate and didn't ask for a postponement. So the second jury never heard about this potential suspect. Bloodsworth was convicted again. When evidence about Rehill finally did get to the court, it was too late. Bloodsworth was sentenced to life. You know, I told people, he's a young man, I'd like to trade places with him, you know, because if I die in there, it wouldn't be much missing, but he had his whole life, you know, in front of him. Curtis and Jeanette Bloodsworth never wavered from their belief in their son's innocence. They spent their life savings and remortgaged their home to raise the more than $100,000 needed for lawyers and investigators. They had a struggle, too. They were in their own prison for nine years, just as well as I was. Kirk Bloodsworth would be in prison today were it not for his persistence and the help of a lawyer of last resort. In 1989, his fifth year in prison, Bloodsworth met Bob Morin. I walked out of the prison and I said, uh, this is a little scary, this kid's innocent. But how to prove it? Morin reinvestigated and rechecked everything. Three more years went by. It looked hopeless. And then Bloodsworth heard about sophisticated new DNA tests, tests that weren't available when he was on trial. I read every piece of stuff I could read on DNA. And my lawyer and I, we sat down and I said, well, what the heck do you got to lose? We sent out the whole, virtually the whole crime scene. Uh, panties, her dress, her shorts. What did they find? They found uh, a, a 16th inch circle that can only be seen under a microscope of uh, semen on the back of the little, outside back of the little girl's panties. A private lab analyzed the tiny semen sample, and in April of this year, the results came back. Bloodsworth was completely eliminated as the source of the semen. Morin called him with the news. Well, I threw the phone up in the air, and I ran out in the hallway, and I ran down the hallway, and I was screaming with both hands up in the air, just like this. You know, it's over. You know, screaming to the top of my lungs, crying. Ah. On June 28th, almost nine years after he was locked up, Kirk Bloodsworth's conviction was overturned. Woo! He was free at last. Man! The sun on that side, and this side of the fence is a lot better than on the other. It was the happiest day in my life. <laughs> I went there in the police car and left in a limo. It'll always be something of wonder to me for the rest of my days. What the story seems to indicate is that it is eerily easy with a weak case to convict an innocent man. Yes. In retrospect, it is. You know, you got to understand that this could happen to anybody. It could happen to you. It could happen to anybody here with us today. I don't like to see anyone, if he's truly innocent, anyone spend any time in jail for something they didn't do. And for that, you know, I would be, be sorry. I don't want to see anybody do that. Whatever they could say to me anyway would be empty words to me because nothing they say or do will give me back at nine years. Nothing. And there's another, even more devastating loss. Bloodsworth's mother died just five months before his release. She, she told me that. She said, you know, you're going you're gonna to get out one day, and everybody's going to know once and for all that you didn't do this, and all this, and put this as far behind you as you can. She believed that you would get out? Oh, yeah, yeah. The only, thing, the only thing that she didn't believe was if she wouldn't live to see it. And we're sitting here today, and she's not here. I just wish she was. So you're kind of starting over again together. Yeah, Working? I suppose. Uh, he helps me out, and, and uh, I can use it now. You know, he's big and strong, and I'm, in, I'm going downhill.
more or less. I owe him my life. I owe my father my very life. Keep him down till you get more in there. Lusworth helps his father in his seasonal crab business. But he has no money, no real job. All we've done right now is put him on the street. He needs a lot of help. I just have to go from here forward and try to put it all back together. I've got my first birthday to be free, the first Thanksgiving, the first Christmas, so many things ahead of me. Lusworth is free in body. The soul will take more time. Hopefully, I'll live a long life and try to accomplish something for myself. Not let this case be my only legacy in life. Bloodsworth might be able to get money from the state of Maryland for all he went through, but first he must get a pardon stating that his conviction is in error. If he's turned down, he may not receive a penny. Edie, what about that other man? Is he considered a suspect? We asked all the police will say officially is that the investigation into this little girl's murder is open. All right. Thank you, Edie. Still ahead, for these teenagers, it's praise the law and pass the ammunition. And you're getting hit with the bill. But next, David Williams' wife had a baby, and then he had labor pains. Now David and Debbie Williams speak out in their first television interview. Did you seriously consider leaving and going to the game? No, absolutely not. I was going to be by her through the whole thing. And I was going to, and if I had to do her again, I'd probably do the same thing. Not since Murphy Brown had her baby has one birth raised such a storm over family values. Houston Oilers offensive tackle David Williams made what he thought was a personal decision and suddenly found himself America's favorite dad. This week, we joined David and Debbie Williams for their first television interview since the big moment. I love it. It's great. There's nothing like a good football game. And to see your husband out there kicking some butt. David Williams Day here at the Dome, and all folks coming in with a newborn baby in tow, got in for half price. So. This past Sunday, fifth-year veteran David Williams was back on familiar turf. He had no trouble handling people 250 pounds and up. It's the 9-pound, 15-ounce variety that can reduce him to a rookie. Do you know what to do with a baby? Do I know what to do with him? Sure. <laughs> Well, I'm uh, learning, I'm learning. He's it's, learning. It's not exactly easy. When right I got up that. this morning to change him, his diaper was on backwards, so he's still learning. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about deep doo-doo. Williams was in it. It all began Saturday before last, when the Oilers' starting offensive tackle was at a Houston hospital helping his wife, Debbie, give birth. The contractions were getting more frequent, and they were, they were a lot, you know, I'm sure a lot more painful the way, you know, she <laughs> You, I could tell, anyway. You mean but, the way she was screaming? Yeah, yeah the way she was screaming. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, <laughs> thank you, David. While David's wife was in labor Saturday, his team was already flying to New England, anticipating his arrival for Sunday's game. It was late in the day, and the clock was ticking. You were in labor, yes. right? A rather intensive labor. Mm -hmm. And what happened? We had we just had we had a couple coaches call and then the, the general manager called. But uh, we were doing everything we could. They had broke my water and um, they were giving me some medicine to try to speed things along. And um, the coaches were telling him, "There's a 6:50 flight, I think it was, and that would be the last one going out for you to make." You know, we told them that uh, you know we were trying our hardest. You know. Then we'd get another phone call and. Uh, I, I keep trying. <laughs> uh, finally, our, our, her doctor came in and just, you know, he was, he, he just said, you know, enough's enough. And he pulled the plug out of the phone and took it out. And uh, that's, how, that's how they stopped. <laughs> pulled the phone right out of the wall. Yes, he did. At that point, it just wouldn't stop ringing. During those many hours that you spent with Debbie and right before the birth, did you seriously consider leaving and going to the game? No. Absolutely not. 
family comes first, and, uh, and it's just something that uh, I felt was important, and I wanted to be there. David and Debbie were especially anxious. Just a year ago, Debbie suffered a painful miscarriage. Finally, at 6.20 p.m., just 30 minutes before the last direct flight to Boston, they became parents to Scott Cooper Williams. When you first held Scott, uh, what was going through your mind? Oh, it was just... Uh, it's hard to... Uh, the words can't explain it. It was just like, you know, he's... Here, he finally... He finally come, and uh, he's with us now, and... It's just the greatest feeling in the world. David missed his flight and the game against New England the next day. So I'm getting the picture that it really wasn't, it's not just the birth, but it, it's those hours afterwards as well. If something would have happened, uh, I could have I never lived it down. And, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty tough on her, and I wanted to be there for her. Offensive coach Bob Young didn't quite see it that way. Everybody wants to see the wife, but you know, that'd be like World War II going on. You say, well, I can't go fight, honey. My, my wife's going to have a baby. You, you got to go to war. You, especially when you get paid like that. Williams, drafted out of the University of Florida in 1989, now earns $2 million a year, or $111,000 a game. That's what the Oilers' front office decided to dock him. Team Vice President Steve Underwood. We weren't asking him to miss being uh, with Debbie while Scott was born. Uh, we were asking him to get to the game after the baby was born. I didn't expect him to pay me for, for, not, for not playing, you know, because I wasn't there to play. I mean, you know, I, I, I had no problem with that. It was worth the $111,000. Mm -hmm. Easily. Had it been a million dollars? Mm-hmm. Two million? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's no money, in, there's not enough money in the world. I mean, I mean, this is, this is part of us, you know? Well, what about people who say you signed a contract um, and wasn't it, wasn't it your responsibility to be there to play? I guess if I was to quit this game tomorrow or whatever, I would still have my family. And my family's first. He signed a two-year contract with the Oilers, that's true, but he has a lifelong contract with Scott and me. Management said, oh, they just accused him of being a traitor to the team and trying to penalize him and everything. We're with David Williams. There. Almost overnight, David. one man's private decision to choose family over work made him a national hero. And I, you know, I try to look at stuff like this philosophically. I mean, think of it. The birth of your son, that's like a once-in-a-lifetime experience. But, you know, you can see the Oilers lose almost any Sunday, so... And if Williams had any ideas about slipping back into the relative obscurity of an offensive tackle... Go, Daddy! Well, the fans last Sunday had a few ideas of their own. Doctor, doctor! It's, it's kicking! <laughs> Daddy, why do you think this story struck such a nerve with the American public? Because I think David took a stand, and people feel like he did what was right and he was criticized for that in a very harsh way. And I think people took exception to that. And I think people respect that all the more, and that's why he's turned into this father of the year or a role model or whatever you want to call it. Williams actually did something that's symbolically going to be very important for men across America. James Levine runs the Fatherhood Project in New York, helping corporate America balance work and family. You know, I did this. I'm a a macho football player, I was willing to take the time to and sacrifice a significant amount of income to be with my family. Um, maybe you can do that too. Anybody in my era would have ever failed a show because they were sitting uh, with their wife while she was in childbirth and all that. You, your career would have ended that weekend. Alec Hawkins played for the Baltimore Colts and Atlanta Falcons in the late 50s and 60s. His priorities reflected the era in which he lived and played. Hawkins says he didn't get to know his own children until they were grown. I have those moments when, uh, when I would go through things with my, with my uh, wife and look at pictures that she had taken with them when they were not, uh, as they were growing up, and, and she said, I wish you could have remembered them then, how cute they were then. And looking back, there's a lot of things you'd like to change in your life, but uh, no, I have no regrets because of the way that they turned out. And David Williams doesn't have any regrets either. What will you tell Scott about all this? You know, I don't think he will really grasp it. Maybe when he's 18 years old, he'll go, well, Dad, you know, I think you probably should have went to that game, you know. That's, that's a lot of money to turn down. <laughs> we asked Williams what he wants Scott to be when he grows up. 
He said, a golfer. Next, these kids are learning to shoot at your expense. Now, this Pentagon program is caught in a crossfire. And kill ahead. What in heaven's name is going on here? You could call it angel fever. The government has a lot of giveaway programs. You know them. Welfare, food stamps, bullocks. Bullocks? Every year, 30 million rounds of ammunition are handed out free. Tonight, our investigative correspondent, Roberta Baskin, takes aim. Roberta? Connie, this program will not go away. While food stamps and welfare are targeted every year for budget cuts, the bullet giveaway is jealously protected. And guess who's on the receiving end? Young men and women, ages 11 to 17. Mr. Chairman and colleagues, I hesitate to get up here because I'm mad. This program is a relic from a former time. Nine These members of Congress are taking pot shots at each other on the floor of the House of Representatives. The fight is over a little piece of shrapnel in the overall Pentagon budget called the Civilian Marksmanship Program. Its annual budget is two and a half million dollars for the express purpose of handing out free ammunition to young people. Over a million dollars of that money goes to support the 33-person bureaucracy headquartered here in this building on Capitol Hill. It's not top secret or classified, but it is off limits to us. The Army says it won't let us pass the guard at the front door. It started in 1903, after the Spanish-American War. Returning officers complained that many of their soldiers couldn't hit that well-known target the broadside of a bar. So Congress said the civilian marksmanship program. Its purpose to have a pool of trained marksmen ready in time of war. The Spanish-American War has been over uh, 90 years. We should declare victory, uh, get rid of this relic, and go forward with things that are needed in our society. Like what? Like child care, like immunization like education. Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney represents New York's East Side. Only a freshman, she's out to kill this long-standing program. The federal government should not be subsidizing recreational shooting any more than they should be uh, subsidizing windsurfing uh, baseball games or football games. You stand up here and you offered an amendment which hurts the minor children in my district. With a civilian marksmanship program in her sights, Maloney has targeted the pet project of her upstate colleague, eight-term Congressman Gerald Solomon, the ranking Republican on the House Rules Committee. In the floor debate, you were angry. Mr. Chairman and colleagues, I hesitate to get up here because I'm mad. Why? I was angry. It is one of the few programs that rural America has for their use. And to see uh, the people who are pretty much just anti-gun, anti-military, deliberately try to knock out a program that's been so effective for 80 years makes you angry. This is Galway, New York, less than an hour north of Albany, Solomon's District. It's what you hope small-town America still looks like, safe, tranquil, picturesque. But then there's not a lot going on for young people here. Okay, you may load and commence firing. But there is the Galway Junior Rifle Club. Josh, give it another click. On right. Wednesday and Friday night, 20 boys and girls take <laughs> aim and fire <laughs> under the watchful eye of Chuck Boykin, forward. their volunteer instructor. So and then follow through more. The kids that go through this program are really learning how to be better adults. The fact that they happen to be shooting rifles while they do that is really a, a minor concern. Galway is one of 1,600 clubs that receive some of the 30 million rounds of government ammo each year. I'm going to them, look. I got groups here. Yeah, look, invalid target man. With rising street violence, critics argue America needs fewer kids with guns, not more. Here you're shooting at a target and you're learning safety, not killing someone. There's more murders in Washington in one day than you would have up here in 10 years. It's not really a question of of the funding for the shooting sports, you're, you're really funding the future of the country. But what does this have to do with this? Remember, the program was created in the first place to prepare people for the military. Ready on the firing line. And why are taxpayers paying for this? 
the national matches, annual rifle and pistol championships. The civilian marksmanship program kicks in more than $800,000, with the National Rifle Association picking up the rest. Reserve General Harry Mott says it's a good investment. Those people might be soldiers someday. In a hurry. To a 1990 report by Congress's General Accounting Office, the program has little to do with the Army. It found that the civilian marksmanship program is not part of any Army plan for mobilization or training. None. We wanted to ask the Army if that report was accurate, but again, nobody would talk with us on camera. If the Army is not relying on the civilian marksmanship program anymore, it's probably because times have changed. Desert Storm showcased high-tech weapons unimaginable in 1903. The draft is gone, replaced by a professional army in which millions are spent to train soldiers to shoot. And it's an army whose strength will be cut by 700,000 by the end of the decade. And why are we spending 2.5 million to prepare people for the military when uh, the military is downsizing? Bring it back, bring it back at you. 29-year-old Darnell Sample joined the Army six years ago, just like his father, hoping to make it a career. He became an expert marksman. I became one of the best, one of the elite, one of the United States Army. Not anymore. Sample now serves only on weekends in the National Guard. He was downsized right out of the Army. Does it make any sense to you that there's this Department of Civilian Marksmanship where they're spending two and a half million dollars to recruit young people to shoot, and then there's you, an I, expert, out of a job. I can't understand that because there is the drill sergeants, drill instructors, that teach individuals how to shoot. So what, what, are the, what are the drill sergeants doing if they have another department? So that's just a waste of money and a waste of time. So how has this program survived since the turn of the century? Defenders say it's because it builds character and discipline. But critics say it's the National Rifle Association, a big supporter of the program and one of the most powerful lobbies on Capitol Hill. Opposed no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. Last Chairman, month, Carolyn Maloney's to attempt to shoot down the Army's civilian marksmanship program was defeated, 242 to 190. It shows how very difficult it is to cut anything from the budget. No matter how ridiculous the program is, you can pass it in the United States Congress. Connie, not only did the civilian marksmanship program survive in the House, but last week in the Senate as well, 67 to 30. It wasn't even close. And the National Rifle Association wouldn't talk about the program on camera. Hmm. Roberta, how many of these young people actually end up in the military? It's interesting, last year, out of the more than 200,000 who went into the military, fewer than 1% went through this program. Thank you, Roberta. When we come back, you'll find out why angels are suddenly taking off. And later, we'll go to California for an update on the fires scorching the Los Angeles area. Did you ever wish you had a guardian angel to watch over you? Well, more than half of all Americans say they do have one. In fact, angel mania is sweeping the country, and we asked our Harry Smith to find out why. Harry? We were curious about buttons like this. Yeah. About six months ago, a year ago, all of a sudden, these little angel buttons started popping up all over the place. Uh -huh. Well, what we found was people have taken this whole idea of believing in angels to celestial heights. <laughs> Allow yourself to feel the intensity that is moving into the room. Janie Howard works in an advertising agency in Maryland, but part-time, she has a higher calling. Angelic blessings, I love you. For over 10 years, Janie Howard has... ...teaching people how to discover their... ...guardian angels and speak with them. But you're being filled with love at all times. She is part of a growing movement that is not organized, has no single leader, and no membership requirements. This isn't a cult. We're not worshiping the angels. Many angel seekers seem to be reasonably down-to-earth people. Everything came together. Who are turning to angels for advice, protection, and healing. I invoke the presence of Archangel Raphael. Do you believe? 
According to a new CBS News poll, 67% of Americans believe in the existence of angels. 54% say they have a guardian angel. And 12% say they have communicated with angels. So would you know an angel if you saw one? People who say they've experienced angels claim sometimes they can smell them, sometimes they're shimmering forms of light or color. They also say angels can look like you or me. Angelologists also tell us that angels are not our long-departed relatives, but are in fact their own separate class of spiritual beings. Ten dollars. Whatever they look like, angels seem to be everywhere these days, from bestseller list to Broadway, where $60 guarantees you a vision. <laughs> Ellen McLaughlin, who appears in Tony Kushner's drama, Angels in America. Every night I walk into it, I realize that I'm walking into people's hopes and dreams. I'm playing a whole culture's dream. There is even a perfume. Just weeks ago, Diana Ross accompanied French designer Terry Mugler to Saks Fifth Avenue in New York for the official launch of his new fragrance, Angel, an expensive scent influenced by, yes, Mugler's own Angel. I think about him, or whatever we call, call it, almost every day. You know, I remember that wonderful movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where when you hear bells, it's a, an angel's got its wings, and I always remember that. Look, Daddy, take this, every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That's right. That's right. Allowing the breath to flow. Alma Daniel makes a living talking to angels. Remembering as you breathe in. Since 1985, Dan has been giving angel workshops apartments overlooking New York Central Park. She is co-author of the book, Ask Your Angels. And now, I'm going to send a, a beam of light and energy from my heart to your heart, Melinda. In a seance-like setting, Alma is working with Melinda and Bruce Sharp, psychotherapists from Connecticut. I think it's kind of blasphemous to feel that you can produce an angel, you can summon an angel. Father Andrew Greeley is a Catholic priest, sociologist, and best-selling author. If there are angels, and I hope there are, they don't come because we snap our fingers. No way. <laughs> they come when they're told to or when they want to. There's a whole bunch of people who are out there doing this sort of stuff. Some of it is real faith. Some of it is real kookiness, and sometimes it's hard to tell what the dividing line is between the two. Faith or kookiness? Listen to what Bruce Sharp's angels told him when he asked if he could get a little help with his psychotherapy patients. Essentially, it's love is detanyopedum. Yes, certainly you can help them. Were you writing down words in English? Well, the first one just came out in Swedish and I wrote it down, I, I wrote that in response in uh, Swedish. In Swedish? Yeah, in a second. You know one Swedish? Day. Yes, I do. Oh, okay. People may watch us and say, these guys are weird, you know, or off the wall. And all I can say is, my life has gotten richer since the angels have come in. People will look at this and they'll say, what is going on? I feel like, um, that I've really been in a closet spiritually because I didn't want to be thought of as a kook and a weirdo. There is a large portion of people in this country who will completely discredit it. Yet when people come out, there are also enough people now that give them support that they're willing to do it. And Toby Weiss runs Power Places Tours, worldwide trips for people who are out of the spiritual closet. Organized religion for many people is not allowing them to fulfill their spiritual needs. My name is Janie. Janie. Janie, Janie Howard, Alma Daniel, and a hundred others gathered recently at one of Weiss's meetings. The first Angel and Nature Spirits Conference in Angel Fire, New Mexico. Make that angel your best friend. These people were willing to plunk down more than a thousand dollars each for eight days of angelic discovery. Just because it's not tangible doesn't mean it's not real. What is real to some followers is that angels can heal.
spiritually, physically, emotionally. I call forth the energies of the great Archangel Raphael. Suddenly, Deborah Forel from Newmanstown, Pennsylvania, is overwhelmed. Keep going, keep going. Now that it's your releasing, you're healing yourself and you're healing many others. Keep going. Let the angels work on you. Forel is experiencing a kind of cosmic cleansing. The angels are getting rid of her negative thoughts and energy. So many people are going through this, and they're scared to share it because they're afraid that people won't understand. I think we've been brought up um, to deny the truth. Barbie Edwards not only understands, she plays along with the angels and sells the music on cassette. Angels are a part of my life, and I wouldn't have any other way. They say seeing is believing, but of course that's not always true. Certainly when it comes to the people who look to the angels, they believe. And therefore, they see. these people don't seem to be concerned that others might perceive them as being eccentric, shall we say? <laughs> <laughs> when we first started working on this, a lot of folks didn't want to go on television. They went back, they consulted their angels, and the angels said, go ahead. It seems the angels think it's time to spread the word, I guess. We should point out there are a lot of people that don't take this to such extremes. They just wear the little buttons and smile angelically. <laughs> Thanks, Harry. We'll be right back. President Clinton today rushed to aid victims of the devastating Southern California fires by declaring five counties disaster areas. Firestorms have now spread over more than 100,000 acres. Nearly 600 homes are in ruins. Tens of thousands of people have been evacuated, and it's not over yet. Our new West Coast correspondent, Bill Ligatuda, is in Laguna Beach with more on the story. Bill? Connie, this is a major disaster, even by California standards, and I've been trying to think of a way to illustrate just how awesome and frightening a firestorm like this can be. So, imagine a tornado, only a tornado that's made of fire. And imagine what it must be like to see it come roaring down a hill, heading for your house. Your neighbors have lost theirs, swallowed up, destroyed in minutes. Burning embers like flying matches are setting more fires everywhere. Gas lines are exploding around you. And the wind, it just won't let up. It's so tragic that you have problems. You, you can't do anything. You cannot do anything to help. If you're brave enough, you try something, as many did. But how can a garden hose possibly fend off this? So what do you do then? You grab what you can and run. Personal belongings, uh, important papers, tax records. And that if you're one of the lucky ones. This is all I got left, my dirty shirt. And imagine coming home to find the only thing left standing is the chimney, the fireplace, and what used to be the living room of your house. Connie, tonight there are dozens of neighborhoods just like this which have been wiped off the map of California. Bill, Californians seem to be subjected to virtually every kind of natural disaster. Could this be the worst kind? I think so. You know, when an earthquake hits, it comes out of nowhere and then it's done with. When there's a flood, at least you can see the direction the water is heading. But these fires really strike fear deep in the hearts of every Californian because the winds that push them along can turn on a dime. They call these Santa Ana winds the devil winds, and that's a pretty good name because last night they sure turned parts of this paradise into hell. Connie? Thanks. Bill Lagatuda, and welcome to Eye to Eye. We'll be seeing and hearing lots more from Bill in the weeks and months ahead. We'll be back with more. Here's a look ahead at next week's Eye to Eye. Pat and Claudia wanted a baby. Mother Nature couldn't help them, but they took a chance on a brand new medical technique. The fate of our child lied in the hands of these embryologists. Right. And that was scary. They not only made a baby, they made history. He's here. He's finally, finally here. Which reminds me, did you see this week that doctors at an in vitro fertilization program in Washington have successfully cloned human embryos? Embryo cloning is not yet 
But this breakthrough has touched off a fierce debate. If each person is unique, do we really want to make copies? And whom would we make copies of? It's hard to think of anyone having that kind of power. But since we're on the subject, here's what we would do. Howard Stern, we think one is more than enough. Ross Perot, he seems to be everywhere as it is. Hillary Rodham Clinton, hmm, yeah. How about Beavis and Butthead? Sorry, boys. And not you guys either. One cloning per customer. Mother Teresa? Absolutely. Donald Trump? Absolutely not. And that goes for you too, Marla. Michael Jordan? Why don't we just give each NBA team one of his clones and let the original enjoy his retirement? Think about it. With the clones, you'd only have to work half as hard. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll see eye to eye again next Thursday at a special time, 10, 9 central. And I'll see you on the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. Good night, Good night everyone. everyone. With today's controversial headlines and emotional front page stories, only one television series can touch you in a way Picket Fences does. Winner of three Emmy Awards, including Best Drama on Television. An all-new Picket Fences is next. For a transcript of this program, send $5 to Eye to Eye Transcripts, Box 7, Livingston, New Jersey, 07039, or call 1-800-777-TEXT. To order a VHS cassette of tonight's broadcast, Call 1-800-CBS News.